Welcome to the New York Weightlifting Podcast. I'm James McDermott, and joining me today is Sarah Soto. We are WSO representatives for the New York Weightlifting State Organization. And today we're going to be talking about one of our all time favorite topics being a technical official and all technically officially things. Uh, Sarah, how are you doing? I'm doing great. It's snowing. I'm happy. Oh, really? It's uh, it's fine out here in Albany. Oh, we finally are getting snow. It's going to be gone in, in like an hour, but <laughs> I'll take yeah. it. But at least you can enjoy a, the sights of it. Like, oh, Correct. there it is. Something white and fluffy, and then it'll be just wet and, and exactly not icy. <laughs> so today we're talking about being a technical official in the sport of weightlifting. You are a IWF category one technical official. This is the highest level that you can go, unless I don't know about any secret levels. That would be cool. No. <laughs> uh, I am a USA weightlifting WSO level. So I'm all the way at the bottom tier trying to work my way up. And we're going to talk about everything in between those two levels, uh, little nuances that people may not know about, and assortment of other topics. And I know this is one of your favorite topics. Yes. Uh, so let's let's dive right into it. What is a technical official? This is a term that people hear, you know, uh, at meets or they hear, see it written in documents. But also we use the term referee, but technical officials, a, a big umbrella term for a lot of different things. So just uh, what is the definition? What is a technical official in a sport of weightlifting? For sure. I actually grabbed this from the IWF uh, TCRR because they actually have at the very beginning of the TCRR, which is the technical. Oh, my goodness. Wow. I can't remember what TCRR stands for because I've just referred to it as that for so long. But anyway, we'll get back to that later. But it a technical official is divine. A technical, a technical, well, a technical <laughs> official is defined as any person who controls the play of a competition by applying the rules and regulations of the sport to make judgments on rule infringement, performance, time, or ranking. A technical official, oh, hold on, my thing just disappeared there. Oh, sorry, I did screen no, share. Okay. <laughs> That's good. Let's do that. <laughs> I, uh, I didn't know if it would take it's away okay. your it, It's your okay. It's okay. Uh, a technical official acts as an impartial judge of sporting competition. This involves an obligation to perform with accuracy, consistency, objectivity, and the highest sense of integrity. Very important. I like that. That That's a nice little write-up. I like how there is like, a def it's almost like a definitive mission statement within the definition. I'm like, this is not only what the job is, what the role entails, but this is what you should be doing as well uh, from like a, a moral sport standpoint. Yes. Yes. Integrity. Important. Yes. And, and I have pulled up on the screen here. Uh, uh, this is the, what did you, what do you say? It's the TCRR. TCRR. So there's the technical and competition rules and regulations. That's the, that is the manual that governs weightlifting in our entire sport internationally. And uh, yeah, actually, like the other page, like I think at the top is where I got the definition from, unless I was looking at an old one. Is it up uh, there? Even? Oh no, they yep, took yep, it. They took it out. Page this one. is like the new. This is the new updated one. Yeah. Yeah. So this this document gets updated regularly, and if you're an athlete, you should glance at this document. It, it tells you essentially all the ins and outs of the competition side of the sport of weightlifting, and then of course, if you're going to be some sort of official or involve yourself on the um, running of meets, you should know this as well. You know, it has in here the definition of the snatch and the clean and jerk, nice gigantic paragraphs on that. <laughs> uh, and then it has all of the rules. So this is, this is the book of the law. You know, this is when, when you get, when you're at the AO series or even a local meet and someone says that lift didn't count, you get a red light. This is where it's coming from. This is, uh, the, the officials are upholding the standard. And even right here, incorrect movements you know these are things that you do that might, might cost you a lift you know uh, a, a unique one here is not facing the center referee at the beginning of the lift uh, <laughs> does does anyone come out and turn their back to the it must have happened before if this is wow in there, right yeah that's a great question i'm gonna have to ask some historians because that's a good one I, I suppose if I'd imagine that this situation probably happened on a grander stage than like a local meet. And it must have been a very upset athlete. Maybe they <laughs> they missed the lift before by a questionable decision. And then they decided that they were going to just not face the referees after that. 
that is the I thing cannot. about these these rules is when you go to read them you should also think in the back of your head the reason it's in here is because it's happened very likely yes yes and so, also these rules it's it's i mean this tcrr is like like you said it's it's the law and usa weightlifting uh follows these you know almost exactly i think there are very very few um differences between usa weightlifting stuff and these yeah and there's a lot of things in here um such as the field of play what is the spacing between the equipment around the competition platform that's something as a technical official you should be mindful of like when you go to a local meet you know if the plates are all the way up against the wood well there is actually a rule that says they're supposed to be x amount of centimeters away for safety if the athlete has to walk laterally left or right or forward or back to save a lift or just stick with the barbell there can't be plates there there can't be chairs there the loaders can't be right on top of the platform because maybe you're trying to get those bars switched as quickly as possible you know um so there there are a lot of safety things in here as well yeah totally how far away the referee table needs to be from the competition platform. So highly recommend people take a look at this. If you are a diehard, a technical official nerd, then this is something great to print out. I have it on a binder, you know, so I have it printed out that way at my meets that I run or when I go places, I just bring it with me just in case. Cause that's another thing you end up at a meet and you're like, well, what is the rule on that? There's a book. There's a book. <laughs> it's true. So now that we know what a technical official is and what the the holy scripture of technical officials is as well, uh, there will be a link to that document in the show notes. A lot of links today. We're going to have a ton of links. Yes, yes. Let's talk about the four levels in the United States. There's four of them. So what are they if you're a person living here in, in the United States and you want to be the highest level possible? Sure. Um, well, first, you absolutely need to be a member. Um, you can be just a coach member, you can be athlete, all the, all of those things. But the first level is the WSO ref. And that used to be called an LWC ref. So sometimes you'll see that cited as such on the USA weightlifting website. It just means it's a little outdated. Um, you can ref at all local and national meets. Once you have this certification, um, you need to pass the WSO certification exam that's on bars, which we'll get to. And you also need to complete your safe sport certification also through bars. <laughs> and that one is a little bit more time intensive. Um, but you need to have those two things in order to be a referee. Um, if you want to help with weigh-ins at a meet, you also need a background check that is certified by USA Weightlifting, which you can also get through bars. Um, the next level is national ref, which you have to meet certain requirements and pass a certain amount of time as a local ref uh, before you go and test for that. And you have to test for that at a national meet. And, um, oh wait, did you want to show also when you become, when you pass your WSO certification, you hopefully get in the mail. What are these little guys? Book. Yes. And mine says LWC. Before we were WSOs, like we talked about in the last episode, we were local weightlifting committees. LWCs. I, well, yeah, was it a committee? It was. I guess it was. Yeah, I wanted to say community for a second, but I was like, <laughs> no, that's not right. It's, it's committee. And in the book, it has little lines where you have the event you work at, the date, what your function was. So if you were a referee, you could put that there. And then you would typically have the meet director. And if you can't find a meet director, maybe if there's a competition secretary, which is a role we'll talk about soon, uh, autograph that for you. And you hold on to this uh, because eventually you're going to need documentation, right, Sarah, to level up? Correct. Um, I highly recommend. I mean, I, the, the books are very nice, but I also recommend maybe keeping like a Google spreadsheet or something like that for yourself. I have one that, you know, I started back in 2013 with every single local, national, international meet, how many sessions I've worked in each job because ultimately they don't check the signatures when you go to apply to the test they just want to know that you've worked that amount of sessions and at what meet so keep that in mind oh it's a good thing to keep track of and, and i mean i'm i should do that i should put all of this on a google sheet because look at how tiny this thing is like i i, I could lose it 
uh, is so easily. You know, you take this to Columbus, Ohio, across the country at the the AO series, and next thing you know, it falls out of your pocket. And this would literally be like my first meat logged in here was 2019. So this would be years of work lost. Uh, and you're motivating me to create a Google Doc. I, I'm yeah. going to do, <laughs> do that idea. very soon. And I mean, like I have, I have the, I've dug up the national one. And as I've talked about with you, James, like personally on the side, like I, I mean, I got this in 2017 and it's like, I have actually only logged one meets worth of jobs in there. And it's got like, I mean, 10 pages in there. So it would never be enough to cover what you need to actually ascend to a higher level. So, yeah. yeah. And you have an IWF book too? I do. So, yeah. So then the next level is the IWF category two technical official. I know this seems counterintuitive. You would think you go level one, level two, but the way it works is level category two. I always try to think of it as like silver and then gold is one in first place, second, whatever. Anyway, uh, yeah. So this at this level, this is the IWF book. You have to pay for this, by the way. This is like $200 for a quad for your license. Wait, that... The book, uh, wait, well, the, the license is $200. Yes. So it's like, that was my, this is now, I've now gotten a cat one, but this is my cat two license in there. So in order to get that sticker, it's $200 and you would have wow. to re-up every quad. So, I mean, it's 50 bucks a year. It's not, yeah. it's not the end of the world. And if, if you're all in, all right, it's an expense you're willing to, to take. And like with the signatures in my book, and I can already tell like the sticker thing would be a problem for me because I'm like... I'm like, all right, I want to fill in all of those little boxes and I want to get all, all the stickers. Oh yeah. <laughs> it's very, this one, this one actually does matter and you do need to take it with you. Uh, if you go work at an international meet, cause it's just like that, it gets very like they, cause you have to hand this to, you do this very fancy procession to the stage when you get introduced at the beginning of a session and then everybody lines up and has to go walk to the jury and you shake hands with the jury and you give this to the head, the president of the jury, and they hold on to it until the end of the session and then give it back to you. Wow. And you also, you also get a, a, an IWF technical official patch. This is another thing that you get with that. And you have to wear that on your left side of your jacket along with a pin, all of these things you have to buy. It's great. But um, yeah, at this well, see, level- See, right now, all of the patch people out there, like there's people that like, all right, it, there's some people that are not gonna understand what I'm talking about, but there are patch people and there are pin people. Mm -hmm. And those people right now are like, si sign me up. I want that <laughs> patch to put on my thing. I want another one to put on my bag. You know, I'm a patch sticker and pin person and I need all of those things, so- definitely a pin person this i mean this this is the patch i care about for sure and i mean it's it's funny because whatever i'm getting into too too much detail but it's like this was actually i inherited this from the chair of the board of directors jenny schumacher because at the time uh it was very hard to get stuff like this from the iwf they just it's like it was just you had to have somebody basically smuggle it over to you from from like another IW official that went to an international meet. So Jenny was kind enough to give me hers when she moved up to category one. And I will give this to you know somebody else. I will pass it on. But yeah. That's really uh, cool. That that patch has some history to it. Yes, yes, it's kind of cool. Um, so that level once you get to the I IWF category officials. Um, so obviously you can work all of the meets, local, national, but now you can start to work international. And uh, so basically you can work any meet that is not world championships or uh, the Olympics. You have to wait until you're the top level to do that. So you kind of get stuck doing like uh, Pan American Weightlifting Federation meets. So that's kind of why I have at that up till now only really done, you know, meets in the Pan Americas. So the Grand Prix and stuff. Um, I don't know if I can do the Grand Prix. Cause it's kind of a thing for the, it's an Olympic qualifier, but yeah, I mean, it's, 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 it's oh, a tricky okay. thing. It depends on like, if, um, so if it's just like a, like Pan Ams, that's like an isolated thing. But if it's like, Hey, this meet is linked directly to the Olympics. We need like, category ones. Yes. They, they always want that for Olympic relative stuff. They want the highest level of a referee or technical official I should say because you do all these jobs um but at this level now with the when you're in the IWF level the thing that gets kind of crazy and interesting and fun speaking of collecting things is at this level it's when your 
you start accruing points when you work at national meets and these points um, go towards your TO ranking list. So, at, well, and we have one, it gets wiped clean every year, January 1st, and you start to accumulate new ones. So for every session you work at a national meet, you get a point. And at the end of the year, you can see there's a, there's a ranking spreadsheet I actually didn't give you the link. I should give you that for later. Uh, that's on the USAW site, but that one is super crucial because, and you can see even national referees get ranked, but based on that, the, the person with the most points, you are going to get called to potentially get nominated for uh, international meets first. And Pedro, who is in charge of events, he starts working down the list in order of points. And he'll say, do you wanna go to this meet? And if you say yes, cool, he'll nominate you. And then if not, he goes on to the next person. So maybe an example of that would be the Olympics in 2028, which is gonna be in the States. Uh, that, that is still the, the plan, I, I believe. That in is, California. Yes. Yeah. Uh, if you wanna be in that chair, you got to get these rankings. Like you got to be at the highest level of the rankings. Yeah. And I mean, it's going to be interesting because since we are the host federation for that meet, we're probably going to get like maybe like 28 slots of people that get to work uh, at the Olympics, but they are really only going to give referee jobs and uh, martial jobs to like the highest level people. So like that, you have a very hard chance at, but you might be able to do a job and be like, timekeeper or or maybe technical controller some something like that that's like a little bit less yeah but hey you're you're still at one of the best seats in the house you yes know, to watch sure. the the highest level of competition in our sport and th just to be there just to be a part of it you know totally totally yes um but yeah so that's always very important everybody always keeps an eye on their rankings and that's kind of why you see at national meets you'll see kind of the same people working all day from beginning to end because they are trying to get those points so that they can potentially work at better international meets yeah. the following year. Th this might be a good time to interject on, you know, uh, if you run across a, a TO and maybe they're a little grumpy, a little tired, uh, have some empathy, <laughs> realize that they've been working days on end, probably from 6 a.m. or whenever the meet started all the way through the end, their feet hurt. They've been sitting in a chair all day. They've been watching all the lifts. They've had angry coaches grumbling on the side, you know, about decisions that they're making. Uh, or they had to tell someone, hey, that part of your costume isn't, you know, uh, uh, has to be changed because it doesn't meet the regulations. They're just trying to do their job. And and That's without right. without them, the meat doesn't happen. You know, like with, if, if you don't have three people in those chairs and some other supporting staff, the athletes can't go out there and do their thing. So have a little bit of empathy. Uh, bring your TOs, a uh, candy bar, a water oh, bottle. Oh, yeah. Sugar, coffee, anything. They will probably be super happy. <laughs> exactly, yeah. You see you see a, a TO at a national meet, you know, may, maybe it's in between sessions. Uh, just to say, hey, can I can I get you anything? How you doing? <laughs> you know? Yeah. Always appreciated. Yeah. Like, it's, it's – and I mean, there's also – um, and then the last level, I mean, basically gets rolled into the category one, the the big difference there, like you're, it's, you still get all of those things, but you also can now work at world championships and uh, the Olympics. And that's a very big deal for people. Like I'm excited to kind of get out of the Pan American region for international meets, hopefully in, in the coming, you know, year or so we'll see. Start seeing but, other parts of the world. Yeah, that'd be cool. That'd be cool. But, um, and then also it's, it should be noted that, um, at national meets when you work at your you get you get paid but it's based on your ranking as a technical official so i believe it's wso refs get five dollars a session yep. and national refs get 10 category two get 15 and category one get 20 so i mean I, again is it is it a lot of money no <laughs> but you do there is there are some perks to climbing the to ladder yeah, and, and you know, uh, USA Weightlifting is a nonprofit organization I in the end. And so, it, you're you're if you're just a WSO level ref and you're getting five dollars, there's at least a little bit towards your gas money to go out to the event, or you know, there's something towards the Chipotle Bowl. It's it's something, you know, it's something. But uh, but really, you're you're not sitting in that chair for the money because it's not a money making thing. It's just like with coaching. A lot of coaches don't make a lot of money, but we do it because of the love of the game. 
and because we want to support and help other people. That's that's part of the function of of a TO. It's not a you're not gonna make a lot of money off of being a technical. No, person. not at all. <laughs> you're gonna lose a lot of money, <laughs> possibly. <laughs> For sure. And um, yeah, that covers all of the levels. And then so. So we got these levels. Uh, just a quick recap. We got uh, the baseline level WSO local referee. Then we have national level technical official category two and then category one. You got uh, it. And uh, it would now be a good time to kind of look at that uh, Avery video. Sure. Or not That's... video, just just a document. Yeah, sure. Yes. So if you want to take your WSO referee exam, um, Avery Marzoff, wonderful gentleman who used to work at USA Weightlifting, made this because it was a little tricky to find in bars, but he made a little walkthrough here of how to access that exam. Yeah. And and like you were saying before, there are some outdated terms like this says uh, how in order to access your LWC referee exam, it's now WSO, but this is like, all right, you know, same, same thing. Uh, you would just log into your membership profile in bars, which, you know, uh, uh, it's very possible. Some people haven't been on bars since they purchased their, their USAW membership. And sometimes it gets confusing because there is a USA weightlifting, you know, website. And then there's this bars website Bars does all the heavy lifting in terms of managing your membership, competition results, uh, finding a meet and signing up for a lot of meets. So you would need to log into that, click your membership uh, profile, click on view, uh, which this actually may have changed because the inside <laughs> of bars is a little bit different. But whatever it is to view your profile, it's a giant blue button now. You can't. You I can't think it says it. view profile. Yes. Yep. Yes. Yes. <laughs> And then once you're on there, there is a menu on the left-hand side of the screen. And if you scroll down that, you will find a button that says Access USAW Learning Academy. And that is another third website, or is it a part of ours? And that handles all of the education side of, of things. I, I believe it's connected, but it is not the same. Yeah. <laughs> uh, once you get onto there, there's a dashboard. And that's where you'll see how it's circled here. USAW referee course. And then once you click that, you can go through the course. It's like a, a PDF presentation that'll bring you through like, what a, what do the plates mean? How do you load the bar? What are the different roles? Uh, and then it takes you through a bunch of examples of good lifts and bad lifts. And you have to, when you take the test, you are quizzed on that where you're showed an example video and maybe uh, it might be a press out and you have to see that and give the correct answer in order to pass. Generally, yeah. there are a lot of people that will help you do this if, if, you're, <laughs> if you're struggling because we need, we need referees. Yes, yes, please. <laughs> the, these instructions will be in the show notes as well. And of course, if at any time you need help with any of this, reach out to myself, reach out to Sarah, reach out to someone else in our organization, uh, one of the other board members, and we will help you get set up because like I said, we, we very much want as many people with this credential as possible. So that I think I don't know if you want to pull it up you can if you want there's that uh links to the slides in the exam if you want to just like thumb through a couple maybe. Oh yes. Uh where is where is that? I think it's on the Oh wait, did I send it to you? Let's see. Oh, I don't think I got that one. Okay, never mind. Sorry. Well, I'll uh, <laughs> send it if you if you send that and that other document through the chat, I can pull pull them up. Hold on. Good call. Yeah, this is this is important to look at because uh, someone might might right now might be thinking, oh, uh, it's an exam, getting a little bit nervous. I got to study all this stuff. It's really a very short presentation, and if you've been competing and doing meets, you're you're probably more in the know than than you think. Yes, here it is. Awesome. Uh, I'm, I'm glad you sent this. To, I was actually looking for it earlier, and I couldn't, <laughs> couldn't find it. So here it is. Uh, the LWC or WSO referee clinic. I'll just scroll through it a little bit here. It tells you the requirements of someone, you know, who wants this, uh, this title, this job. Gives you requirements, you know, uh, you have to complete that course online, background check every two years, a safe sport training. Uh, that's very important. Pass the exam. 
uh, responsibilities and everything you see in this document, you know, this is um, it's on the test and it's, it's essentially an open book test now, right? Is that how it is? Pretty much. Yeah. I mean, yeah. this link I actually found on, it was like separate outside, like it was on the USAW like slash referees, uh, like across the top, it was like referee clinic and I clicked on it and it brought you to this. But I mean, this is literally the little like course you have to go through before you take the exam, like same thing. Yep. Knowing important terms, what the body weight classes are, you know, and this is just great to keep on you, you know, save somewhere in your email, because these are questions that pop up all the time. What What are the weight classes again for this division for youths, juniors, uh, all, all these things? And sometimes it does get a little complicated because especially in USA weightlifting, there are a lot of sub weight categories. Like you see here for youth, there's weight classes for 13 and under. And then there's weight classes for 14 to 15 years old and 16 to 17 and up. So it does get a, a little hairy when it comes to some of the stuff that you need to know. It does, uh, yeah. Here's another great example. We were talking about this earlier on how far away the referees need to be, how far away the chairs of the three referees need to be from one another, the competition platform. I like how they added a uh, little stairs there. I'm assuming those are, those are stairs. Yeah, I never really thought about that, but yeah. yeah and so this is obviously at a national or higher event. Most of the time, it's raised, but at a local event, you're not gonna you're not gonna get that. So this is everything that you need to know to pass the first level. And uh, like I said, it's it's kind of an open book test, so you no one's gonna be mad at you for having to research an answer uh, and then getting involved in the sport and continuing to grow. So, oh, yes. there's a little important note there too that kind of gets overlooked if you scroll up a little bit. The little asterisk. Oh, right at here. The bottom, yeah. That LWC. That's just like little little fun fact. Is that yeah? If athletes that are in their first year of membership, uh, you are allowed, allowed to, and it says who are under 21, but that is abs That's actually been wiped clean, and any athlete in their first year of membership is permitted to compete without a singlet. Just FYI. Yeah. That, that, that's a, a great thing to know because that singlet is oftentimes a barrier to entry to even just participating in the sport. And I know it's helped me as a coach recently on just getting people in and, you know, uh, people are always nervous about putting on the singlet and no matter how many times you tell them you're, you're 10% stronger for singlet and everybody looks good in a singlet, no one believes you until they actually put one on and get, get comfortable <laughs> with it. That's true. <laughs> So that, that is a, a very important thing to know. And sometimes uh, we've even, I've even experienced higher level officials that maybe didn't get this notice and they're confused. They're like, wait a minute, why is that guy wearing a pair of shorts and a t-shirt? And it's like, he can now. So yep. this wasn't the case uh, years ago. What, when did that rule change? Oh, I want to say it was, hmm. I remember I actually, you and I had talked about this and I went through the old board of directors meetings to find it and it was in there. And I want to say that that was like 2022, maybe. Yeah. But yeah. Yeah. Cause that, because my meet last year is when the topic came up mm -hmm. and, and knowing little things like this, such as what's appropriate on the costume, you know, or, or the, you know, the singlet, but everything else in, involved. There are very specific rules on this. And if you're just working at a local meet and you're a WSO ref and you're not attuned to these things, you just sit down in the chair and you're like, I'm just looking for press outs. But really, you there is more that you should be doing to keep the competition fair. Uh, like you can see this over here. This uh, outfit is not OK versus the one on the on the right is not OK. The one on the left is OK. Sarah, why is the one on the right not OK? Was the, oh, because the stripes, it's so tiny on my screen. Sorry. Uh, okay. There's a stripe down the leggings. Got to be a solid color leggings. Yep. So it's a, there are very specific rules. And these this goes all the way back to the, uh, the the IWF manual that it has to be one solid color, you know, and it has to be underneath the singlet, you know, all, all that stuff. So just knowing that I've had plenty of times where I'm sitting in the chair and an athlete will run out because maybe they're tight on time and they're still wearing a T-shirt. And it's like... Yeah. Uh, I know you have 20 seconds left, but you have to take off that T-shirt and strap up your singlets. <laughs> Otherwise, the lift doesn't count. Right, Sarah? Sure. Yeah, that is that is how it's supposed to be. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, we don't enjoy uh, those situations, you know. No. I mean, we're, we're kind of fair. Like, 
you know, I've, I've been told by my, you know, predecessors and stuff who have like mentored me um, that like, you know, it's like, let's say somebody comes out, takes the lift and that's the thing too, we'll get to it later, but like, that's what a technical controller does. They're supposed to kind of be looking out for those things. That is one of the technical official jobs, but um, they are supposed to be looking out for that stuff. But at national meets, we do not tend to have technical controllers because we are so it's, it's hard to find staff for the actual critical positions. So in that case, the center referee is supposed to be in charge and uh, you're supposed to be looking for that. But sometimes like you're sitting in a chair, right? Somebody comes out and the legging has a design on it. Nobody caught it in the back or anything. You see that lift, like then at that point, I'll be like time out and I run to the back and I let the athlete know that the next time you come out, like that you either have to turn the leggings inside out take them off try another pair of some, something like that so it's like we're harsh but like we're, we're not gonna be like oh my god you have a one minute clock you have to run to the bathroom take your singlet off and take those leggings off in that 60 seconds like that's yeah insane so yeah yeah and that's that's incredibly stressful for the athlete and the coach and and uh maybe um regardless of popular belief but the technical officials do want to see everybody succeed you know they they are not against you. This is not an us versus them type of thing, even though it feels like that. Sure. You as an athlete have to do your due diligence to know this stuff. You know, so I saw it many times last year at the Arnold where athletes had uh, issues with the leggings under their singlets. And it's it's there. Like, like uh, you should read the rule book. You should read this. If you are an athlete and you take this course, you'll be well informed. And also there's a responsibility for your coach to know this stuff. Like you're, mm. you have to, you have to know this stuff, especially if you're going to those big meets, you know, if you've been doing the local circuit and getting away with things, that doesn't mean it's okay. You've just been kind of skirting around and people haven't caught it because they're learning too. But when you go to the national level meets, they're going to hold you accountable to what you agreed to. That's the thing too. When you sign up for the meet, you agreed to it. When you sign up for USAW membership, you agreed to it. There's no one to be mad about or uh, um, mad towards other than yourself. That's a you mistake. That's not a Sarah mistake or the meet mistake or a USAW mistake. They want you to succeed and these resources are out there for you to succeed. For sure. I mean, this is why, I mean, I, I know you do this as well, but it's like uh, I the meets that I run I follow national guidelines and I run a meet just like I would at a national meet because I want athletes from my region to and my community to be super prepared when they go for a national event. Like, I just want them to like, know you're weighing in in a singlet, bam, you're ready. Like, you don't have to be told twice, know your openers, like all the, all the stuff. I just want them to be as prepared for success as possible so that they go. There's, you know, one less thing to be nervous about. Oh, yeah. Yeah, uh, 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 at state championships, we try to run that as close as possible to the national level because we're using states as a vehicle for that next step. Hey, when you go to the AO series, you may not have been there yet, and that's the next accessible level. Uh, you, you These are the rules that the weigh in. Hey, after the verification of entries meeting, which we'll talk about what those are soon, uh, we're not taking any changes. Like, you should have that stuff locked in, you know? Yeah, yeah. Uh, here's the thing on, on the weigh-ins, know the ins and outs of the weigh-ins. Uh, and I have these cards here. There's a whole technical official script that you can download. Uh, and I'll have in the show notes, the document for that. Like there's going to be so many little links in there, but hopefully this will be a resource that you can come back to and be like, where can I find that document? Come back to the episode and look in the show notes. Uh, these are the regulations for weighing in on a singlet. And I just had a question for you this past weekend about that, which we can talk about real quick here. And then uh, this is the protocol for the official filling out the athlete card uh, and all that stuff. So these are uh, not only do you have to be versed in the rules, but you have to familiar yourself, familiar, familiarize yourself with those documents. Yes, all all excellent resources and like th those things that I have passed on to you those protocol sheets um are all on the usaw website so um we'll put that link in there yeah yeah uh the, the question i had over the weekend was with the weigh-in with the new weigh-in rules so uh, this is a relatively new thing within the last year where the rule is now you have to weigh in in your singlet and actually i don't even know if the screen i have it in on right now and here has been updated yet uh, maybe not but 
that is the case now. So you can't strip down. You can't be naked. You got everybody is in a singlet strapped up and the singlet uh, you're allotted 250 grams for your body weight because that's accounting for the weight of the singlet. You can have as light of a singlet as you want. And, and correct me if I'm wrong, it doesn't have to be the singlet you're competing in. You just have to have a singlet or bodysuit that you weigh in on. And my question over the weekend was, if someone weighs in at, let's say, uh, 81.25 kilos, uh, what do we put into bars as their official body weight? And you said that the answer is? 81. 81. 0, 0. <laughs> 0, 0. So you don't have to subtract 250. Like if they weighed in at 81.05, you don't subtract 250 grams from that. And it's, and they're like 80 point whatever, you know, you just, the default is 81 at that point. Yes. You'll, you'll see that too. Like at like national meets, you'll be like, Oh, look at all these people who weighed in on the dot. And it's like, that might not actually be the case. It might just be that that's, you know, with the singlet allowance, that's what their weight was. Yeah. Yep. So yes, definitely take a, take a look at this whole document and take that test. So these will be paired together in the show notes, that document that Avery made on how to find the, the test. And also this is, this is the workbook to, to know the answers and to pass that test. So we've gone through the levels, we've gone through finding the course in bars, and we've also gone through, let me uh, close this. All right, there we go. Uh, the 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 different levels and everything. Let's, there there is a question here that came in through Instagram when I put it out there uh, awesome. about the levels. Uh, so Michelle Wugan, our Western athlete rep, uh, the New York WSO, she asked, do you need to ref at least two sessions at a meet for those hours to count towards advancement? It's just by session. Like it doesn't, yeah, there's no like hourly tracking. It doesn't matter, which is why it's crazy. Cause it's like, if, even if you just do a weigh-in that counts as a session that is separate from refereeing. Like, so it's like in theory in one session, if you do a weigh-in and then referee, you're, you're getting credit for two sessions. But yeah, no hourly tracking at all. Just keep your sessions logged. Yep. Got it. So so it, you don't have, there's no minimum work requirement at a meet where you're not going to be like, hey, I only got, I'm coaching, I'm lifting. I only got time to ref the last session. That counts and it's appreciated. Yes, absolutely. Mm -hmm. And I mean, if you want to pull up the advancement requirements. Yes, let me pull that up. Whoops, wait a minute. Am I screen sharing right now? No, not yet. Okay. Screen share. All right. So the advancement requirements. Nope. That's a checklist. I think it's the first one you sent me. There we go. Okay. Can yeah. you see this document? Mm -hmm. Perfect. So this All is right. a little outdated. It has been updated as of now, as of the recording of this, uh, podcast, but um, it just has not been uploaded to the USAW website yet. But um, the only thing I believe that's changing is that uh, later in the list of if you scroll down, it's more for international stuff. But um, like the list of meets that count for, you know, getting po accruing points for your rankings list. Um, oh, all this. Yeah, like that stuff. I uh, The Howard Cohen American Masters is no longer on that list. Got it. Okay. I think that's Which, it. That's a whole nother podcast. Yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, but I mean, this, this has all of the requirements that you need. So it's like, it, it's not just a matter of being a local ref for two years. You have to make sure you have accumulated all of the, these sessions and in these positions, these different jobs before you will be able to apply. Yeah. So uh, as a WSO referee, uh, you got to be at that level for at least 24 months. So you can't just like take the local ref course and then uh, take it today and a month from now go to the AO series and start getting points towards being a national referee. You have to have – there's time parameters, right? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, so I mean basically that means that the quickest – you can jump from WSO ref to a national ref is 
let's see. I'm going to, I mean, it's, it's, two, it's two years. If you get all of those sessions, the, the 10 sessions at a national competition, and then the additional 20 sessions at local or national, if you can complete all of that in the two years after you've t passed your exam, then you are eligible to test, but you do have three years to be able to accumulate all of those sessions to, in order to be able to. So if you go, if you do all of those sessions and they're spread out over four years, no good. <laughs> yeah. It has to be three years or less, three or two or three years. So yeah. Got it. And uh, if we look at the national competition requirements, uh, you have to have those 10 sessions total and, but they're split. So you have to have five sessions working as a referee in the chair then you have to have five sessions in other positions, such as being uh, the marshal, a timekeeper, a speaker, a working the weigh-ins. That way you're a well-rounded technical official. And also because you could show up at a national meet and they're like, ah, Sarah, we need to move you from the chair so you can go do this other job that someone else can't or something like that. Well, te technically you are allowed to include ref sessions that are in excess of those five so it's like oh really yeah the, like it says includes referee sessions in excess of the five so you you can oh. and then yeah same for part b for the local meet stuff okay, i completely looked over that yeah that you're right though i i like your your thinking but it but yes they they will allow that so and i mean we'll take all the help we can get <laughs> yeah, definitely. And, and i think uh it's it's worth it too to to learn the jobs because every job has a different application to the rules and things yes. that you have to know. So, so that, so even if you work as the tech controller or a speaker or doing the weigh-ins, you're probably going to be even better off sitting in the chair, looking at, at the lifts. Totally. Mm -hmm. Perfect. So, so we have these, these levels here in this document. I'm going to also switch over to our website. Uh, uh, did uh, the screen change for you? Okay, cool. So uh, the a lot of the criteria is listed here too. Uh, also, in addition to what the what you have to do for the test. So like like the, right here, we're all the way up at category one because that's the first one that's list, listed. This these are all the things that you need to sit for that test and the kind of score you need to get too. So it says here you have to attend the online candidate rules seminar and pass the written test with a minimum score of ninety percent because there is a written test at these other levels and a practical test. Can you go into the process there? You could you could even just use the national level as an example, if, if there is a written and a practical part of that. Sure. Um, so it's all based on even the national level. It's based on the IWF TCRR. So that book that we were looking at at the very beginning of talking about all of this stuff. Um, not that one's the exam, is in that book but unfortunately i'm gonna have to send you a link because it's not the the most updated one which is a little confusing right now they need to update it it's still from like 2019 and that is still the written exam that they will give you even to this day i mean i don't think there are any differences actually like nothing that's in the test is actually based on any of the rule changes but um but yeah and i mean again speaking of open book like you have the exam and you have the answers so you know what you need to do so um i believe it says there so it's like for uh for national ref do we have that the, the percentage yes. you need to get yep i'll scroll down to that i think it's 90 yeah there we go so these are percentages each section it shows the percentages that you need to hit um uh at, in your written test and in your practical and uh, written test now is every everything is taken on zoom and you get proctored like everybody that's taking the test before ahead of a meet will uh, get hop on a zoom call with Jenny Schumacher who's in charge of the testing for the technical committee um, and she proctors you and you take the exam she has like a google spreadsheet with all of the questions in it and you will put your answers in and and then that's done she'll grade it get back to you let you know if you pass that or not and then uh, once, oh, and all of this, I should say in the beginning, uh, did I give you the link for the applications? Uh, no. Okay. Uh, oh, oh no, I, I think you did. Okay. But, um, th that is where you would go to apply when you're ready. Oh, like, yeah, right there. Yeah, exactly. So like right there, national TO application and then the higher levels, um, they, they also have this, the requirements that you need 
uh, listed when you click on there, but that is what where you apply. You would put in all of your the meets and the sessions you have worked so that she can check it. Jenny compiles those once you've applied. She takes it to the technical committee and the technical committee approves and uh, uh, lets you know which meet you will be testing at, which national meet you'll be testing at. Um, so yeah, so you take the practical test and everybody can do that together, like na a mix of national and all the IWF refs, you can all just take those together. She does that a few times a year. So you have to wait until that testing date for the written. And then for the practical exam, you would be told which national meet you get to go get tested at. And you can expect to work a lot because <laughs> oh, yeah. you're going, you're going to test and you have to, what is the word? Adjudicate. Yes. A hundred lifts. And then from based on those hundred lifts, you have to, you as a national ref, you have to get 90% or above uh, cat two, 90% or above. And then cat one, 95% or above. Wow. Uh, it's, it's very tough. Um, and, and, and during that, someone is physically watching you. They're sitting behind you. So if you're a national ref, if I go to sit down to do this practical testing, Sarah might be behind me and I watch a lift. And she watches a lift and our decisions need to match that 90% of the time, right? Yes. Yes. So yeah. You have, and I mean, whenever you're testing at a national meet, you will, you will have a jury sitting behind you. So it's, it's really, you want, it's, 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 yeah, there are three people that will be sitting behind you for the testing. And then uh, Jenny calculates after a couple of sessions, um, because it depends. Sometimes you don't have enough lifters in a session to be able to have enough lifts to do it. So, it's, you know, don't get discouraged if you have to go into two or three sessions, like that's just the lay of the land. Um, but that's just refereeing. And then for the rest of the practical test, you're not graded anymore, but you have to do every single job, uh, including timekeeper, which is like kind of not like an official position, but you have to do them all at least twice during a meet. So yeah, you can, and you can expect to work a lot and Jenny will assign you to those sessions ahead of time. So you got to work the weigh-ins at least twice. You got to work the Marshall table at least twice, uh, yep. all those little jobs. Yep. Exactly. Very cool. Mm -hmm. I have I have a a bit of advice for someone who might be pursuing this. Uh, let's say you're nervous about having someone watch you, right? Uh, a lot of meets, uh, like like mine, I like to put it out there where, hey, does anyone want to shadow one of our national or cat one or two technical officials? Where you could maybe sit by, sit next to them in the chair and watch them make a decision, note it down on your piece of paper, and see if you match them. Uh, I did this last year at the Long Island, uh, uh, the Larry Mintz Memorial. I was second chair next to Jerry, and I matched Jerry on all the decisions except for one. We had a disagreement on, so <laughs> I was pretty, I was pretty happy about that. And the same with Dina Smith. Uh, I think we only disagreed twice, so that's a pretty high percentage right there. And I, we, we I was reffing hard, like <laughs> out, like, but it, it's, I, I was treating it like that, and I was like, wow, I'm reffing way harder and holding a higher standard trying to match them then maybe i would have not with if they weren't there you know it's it's like you're just like way more tuned in and if you're not comfortable asking for you know to shadow another thing you could do is let's say you see sarah is refing at a meet like the state championships and you have nothing to do that session and you're just sitting in the crowd we'll just watch watch that and see how often you match with what sarah says or what another a high level ref says, and that right there, you're kind of doing the practical. So you can practice the practical out at any local meet or even a, a, a national meet. If you're at the AO series, you have nothing to do. And this is important to you practice. Uh, and, and if you're watching the event anyways, you might as well get the, that practice. Yeah. That's a great idea. Well, um, I, I know this is, this is taboo. So like, uh, so since we're kind of on the topic of watching and shadowing a person, uh, sometimes coaches don't understand that when their athlete misses a lift, they're like, what was wrong with that? And then they'll, they'll yell to the refs or something. Was it, was it the elbow or something? Uh, they can't tell you, right? Um, that's actually like the, the point is the referees don't have to tell you. So you can ask if you want to ask, I highly recommend you do it with a very nice smile on your face and maybe more of like a like, hey, we're just trying to learn kind of face when you look over at the referees and ask for their, they'll, they'll be more likely to potentially like nod their head or shake their head. Um, 
but uh, referees do not are not required to give a response on what that what the you know the problem was with the lift. Yeah, and and, so. and I I've heard it mentioned that if they did, that's kind of like coaching. It's kind of like giving you the answer when you should have the answer. Is that no longer a thing? So they actually can tell you now if they want if they want. I don't. I mean, that's always been the way I have been taught especially at like the local level because it's just like we're all trying to make everybody better right yeah local level makes sense yeah what what's what's the harm and I mean at national level still too like Joe Triolo has told me like it's you know it's it's your choice you could tell them you cannot there are certain referees who are like very formal and they will not they won't even look at you like they will just pretend they cannot see you flailing your arms over on the side you know but um yeah don't walk over there don't stay stay in the box that you're supposed to be in as a coach like over on the side by the stairs but uh yeah that's yeah yeah uh, i do like how on this the application page here for usa weightlifting uh it also lists adaptive referee testing requirements uh so usaw will accommodate you if let's say you're visually impaired hearing impaired any other type of thing going on because uh, anyone can can do these things so if, if you want to be involved in the officiating side of the sport uh but you have some sort of a limitation don't let that hold you back uh everybody is 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 welcome you know yes let me all right we got that going there uh so a- anything uh else to add on the the different levels and the, the testing or anything like that no i think that was super thorough <laughs> uh s- s- uh side question uh, I don't know if you've experienced this, but some people might, uh, especially at the WSO level, as they're trying to become a national referee and they're sitting in the chair and they're refing athletes. One, how do you overcome maybe a little bit of imposter syndrome? Like, should I be sitting in this chair? Who am I to say that lift doesn't count? Well, it was close. Like, how do you deal with that? Uh, so there's three questions here. How do you deal with the imposter syndrome? How do you deal with the guilt that might come with with a no a no lift? <laughs> And then when there are, this is a thing it, that I've experienced in other, other sports. When the athlete is of a certain caliber, everyone kind of clamps up a little bit and you don't want to be the one that gives Lasha the red light. You don't want to be the one that, that Maddie Rogers is out there and you saw a little wiggle, but you're, everyone else said it was good. So you're, it's the, it's the last lift of the session, last lift of the day. It's the biggest weight of the day and you're going to be the one that hits the red light because it didn't count like that takes strong confidence in your to ability and upholding the standard uh which it's it's hard it's hard so how do you deal with all that let's talk about imposter syndrome first if you've experienced sure oh yeah for sure i mean all the time still even even now like sometimes i'm sitting there with you know people who have been a category one official for like like jerry for example or or joe triolo and you're sitting near them and i'm like i mean even if we're just refing, we're not on jury or something like that it's like you still are comparing yourself to, to what their their calls were and then like second guessing like well wait did I, like that was oscillation like very clearly right like you know things like that but um it, so it's okay it's it's I'm just expecting that that's going to be the way it's going to be for my whole life and if I get too like set and I feel very confident in it I think maybe something's wrong <laughs> yeah because you, and, you and, don't want to become complacent right, right. where where you're just passing everything. You don't want to be the judge where people look out there and they're like, oh, that's Sarah. We're getting lifts passed today. That's absolutely true. Like, I don't ever want to be the person. I mean, it happens in our TO community, like nationally. It's just like, I don't want to be known as like any specific type of rep. Like, oh, she's really nice. Or like, he's really harsh or something like that. Like, like I mean, going back to that definition we read at the beginning, right? It's all about like upholding the integrity of the sport. So, I mean, we, we are taking these tests. We are taking this stuff very seriously. Um, I mean, I think back even to when I just was a local ref and it's like when I was going to meets and I was pretty new, uh, I mean, even as an athlete, I would go to local meets and I would get white lighted on stuff. And then when I went to my very first, uh, masters nationals, all of, I mean, we're going to talk jerks specifically. I have a problem with jerks working on it still 10 years later, 
but a um, jerk is but a yeah. jerk <laughs> it is but um but yeah and then I went to master's nationals where all of the referees sitting in the chairs were IWF category two or higher officials be- and and it was like I was getting I I didn't bomb out but I was getting a lot of red lights and it's like it hit me and I was like like wait this is why this is so important to like uphold those rules because as you start progressing and getting better and better and going to national meets, going to international meets, whatever, you're going to have a higher caliber caliber referee judging you. So it's like it's important to to just and make sure you're upholding those standards. At the at the local level, you if that happens, so if Sarah gets to the national level and she's getting everything turned down, we have not done a good enough job at the local level to set you up for success. But by giving you that instant gratification, by giving you your last lift, or you're like this, you need this lift to not bomb out and stuff like that, to not let you learn the hard way at the local level, it it really impacts you at that national level, which remember, the national level is more expensive. So maybe you're sitting in the chair and you're thinking, well, they paid their 50 to $80 to do this local meet. I, I, want, I don't want them to bomb out. That stinks. I know how that feels. But when they go to the national level, there's hotel, travel, uh, 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 plane, food, the expense of the actual meat itself. What more of a shame it would be to have them learn the hard way there when the financial burden on the athlete is way higher. Uh, so that that kind of stinks. Um, it if, it if does. That's what's going on. But I mean, that's not a TO's fault. Like may- maybe yeah. maybe you and your coach need to assess openers better or something <laughs> <laughs> like yes. now you now you know how to go back to the drawing board and, and fix those things hopefully after something like that but yeah. yes for sure and, and like, another thing to think about would be let's say you're lax with one person right and you let their lift squeak by uh you've just affected the outcome of the competition potentially you know like like maybe sarah gets the gold medal and another person gets a silver and bronze the order might have been different had you held sarah to the higher standard Especially if you're not able to keep the standard consistent from lifter to lifter when their movement looks different. So uh, uh, you might be like, all right, I'm going to have some mercy on Sarah. What about her competitors? Are you going to have like your decision to have mercy on Sarah affects other people in the competition too. So if you're thinking, I don't want her to have a bad experience. What about the other 10 women in the session too? Because now their experience is lessened because you gave Sarah preferential treatment. Totally. And I mean, this um, coming back to you asking about the guilt that you might feel. So this is a problem usually for youth and masters lifters. Right. And it's like people will will get really excited that like a 10 year old kid is lifting in front of them or like you know, an 80 year old man is, is, is lifting and you're like, holy crap, this is amazing. I hope I can be doing that at that age. And you're just like, this is such a feat in and of itself that this person has trained to get to this point. And it's like, you cannot get lax at that point. Cause again, we're trying to uphold the standard of the meat, uphold the rules and, and set the person up for success. Cause in, especially at the local level, chances are that this, these kids or these people are trying to, um, you know, qualify for a national event. And it's like, you don't want them to be, like we said, upset when they get there and those lifts are not acceptable at that point. I mean, I have actually uh, made children cry with red lights and it sucks. <laughs> it but, does. But at the same time, it's like, anytime that's ever happened, it's like, you know, it's like, oh, a jerk that's like, eh. It, like you can't like I can't it's not even like a little press out or anything like that like I'm like I am so sorry but I have no choice but to hit the red button and most times I will watch the parents or the coach or whoever talking to the child and and the the parent or the coach seems to get it so it's like they, they understand they, they yeah. know it has to be fixed I mean I don't think I've had any of those people kids or or grown adults like bomb out that way so it's like they they have fixed it so i can i I am glad that that weightlifting is a sport that doesn't have as extreme at least as far as i've experienced um parents or coaches that will like find you after the event like i've heard horror stories from gymnastics about referees being cornered in a bathroom by the parents who were not appreciative of the number score they got on a routine and people being attacked in parking lots and whatnot i'm 
I am glad that that isn't a thing in weightlifting. I mean, Jen, it's it's not like a, a thing for sure, but I, I've definitely had some athletes come up to me that have been upset showing me a video or something like that saying, you know, like this, this wasn't a press out. And I'm like, cool. That's the angle of the back that your coach took of your butt on the stage. Like yeah. you can't like, I, I, that's not evidence. Like, <laughs> yeah. And, and I don't think that's a good practice for athletes, coaches, or teams where you have people out in the crowd filming a lift and then they race back there with evidence and all this stuff, especially if they have more attempts, like let it go and do it better the next time. Right. And, right. And seek guidance after the fact. Hey, can you explain to us why this was a no lift so we can learn and do better in the gym and next time? But but it don't like this isn't court and you don't have there's no conspiracy. You don't have evidence of all, all what you think you have. Uh, and, and also the ruling is not going to be overturned. Like the referees are official are, are, are human beings. They do make errors. Stuff happens. Everybody's looking at, you know, I might be looking at the right elbow. You're looking at the left elbow. So you'd even see the right elbow and they're at, talking to you about it. And the center rep is looking at the whole picture. It's not going to be overturned. You are not going to win this argument. You just need to do better next time and better on the next lift. Sure. And that's why there are three referees and then potentially a jury behind you. It's like, it's like a firing squad, right? Like it's like no one person has to suffer like, you know, and be the one in charge for the, the sole decision of a lift being good or bad. So, yeah, I mean, I know I know a lot of people think that, you know, referees are crazy and stuff and see things that don't happen. But it's I mean, like, I mean, I've had that happen where I'm like, OK, it was during a testing session where this happened with me and somebody came up to me after. And I, it's like, you know, I'm like, well, the three of us said it was no lift. And also there are three people on a jury behind us and they didn't overturn it. So. Yeah, I don't know what to tell you. <laughs> and, and, you know, not not to get into coaching, but how you as a coach um, react to that situation affects your athlete. And you also teach them how to react to the situation as well. They should just wave at the end of the session, still shake everyone's hand, all that stuff. And, and you know the secrets of your athletes technique. Like, like if, if a lift gets called on any one of my lifters. I have probably two to three things that I'm like, it was probably this, or it was probably that. And also if you're watching them in the warmups, you can see things start to pop up. So, you know, fix it the way you would fix it in training. And hopefully you're seeing it in training because it all comes back down to what are you letting go in training? Are you letting the press outs go in training? Then you're, then they're, they're going to be present at the competition. Absolutely. Yeah. That, that's a whole nother conversation. Cause <laughs> If you, if you, if you press out on a PR, yes, it's still a PR. It's a training PR. Don't, but like still draw attention to it is what I'm saying. Like, Hey, you're a little loose on that elbow. We should fix it. Yeah. Uh, yeah. All right. How about the last part of that question? Uh, high level athletes. You're at the local meet. Maddie Rogers is signed on and she's lifting and it's a tremendous weight and everyone's there for the show. How does the local WSO referee handle this? How how do they, because it's pressure. You feel it when you're in the chair, you know. You just have to, I mean, same for everybody. Everybody is equal, same standards, same high standards. Please uh, don't don't be, you know, loose, especially with, the, with the, if you get somebody like Maddie Rogers or Juliana Rioto in front of you. These are people who have lifted at Worlds. These are people who have lifted at National Championships for years. You know what I mean? It's like they are used to the strict judging, uh, whether they agree with it or not. So it's like you can feel confident knowing that like if you are confident in the rules you are going to give the right decision they treat everybody the same i like how you said that you know no one is better better than anyone else that they deserve special treatment and, yeah and and really like for those athletes if we talk about setting athletes up for success they need your hard judging at the local level and the national level so that when they go to the olympics and world championships they know better and they're they're used to it and and they can handle it too. Like imagine if everybody was just telling you, you're so good all the time. You're so good all the time. Then you go to a situation and they're like, you're not that good. It's going to hit you like a, a sack of bricks. That's a, yeah, good analogy. <laughs> um, Any other thoughts on, on these topics? No, that's cool. also pretty good. <laughs> so let, let's go into the, the ins and outs of each, each job uh, re real quickly here. Uh, there are a lot of technical official jobs under our big umbrella of the term 
The first one, of course, are the three referees. That's the one that everyone knows right off the bat. Can you speak real quickly on how you should order, like, like, like who should be in the center chair based on experience versus a side chair, theoretically? Um, I mean, I have, I, when I came up, you know, like I said, 10 years ago doing this, uh, the, the kind of protocol was always to let the most experienced referee sit in the center. But I mean, it's, it's not really a thing. I mean, I, I will say personally, uh, the center position, like you said, you could see everything. So it's like, maybe if you're trying to learn and, and ascend to a higher level of referee and like, you're getting ready for the practical I, I, maybe you should go sit in one of the left or right chairs to, to practice and see what that's like, because you're not necessarily going to be sitting in the, the nicer, easier center referee spot for all of your practical, you know, like you're going to get assigned to a chair specifically. So um, yeah, I don't know. So I, I'm, I'm kind of more of the mindset that it's better to just like let everybody sign up for whatever position and, and that's it. And if, I mean, people can be, harsh about that and try to put the you know move move people around but i yeah. say for everybody's well-being it's better to have the practice in all spots and and if you're in the hot seat you know so to say the middle one uh and it's your first time and there is a a more experienced referees to your left and right uh it's okay to talk to them between lifts you know if there's a two minute clock or something like hey on that last one did you see the, the oh okay you did all right or if they're like, no, that wasn't a press out. That was shoulder movement. But you call it as a press out. You're getting the correction right there. You know, uh, so right. ask ask for help. Um, it doesn't have to be silent, just full, full on the whole time. Well, you're not really supposed to talk about it like right after a lift. You're supposed to like oh, if you want to talk oh. about it during a break. But like the whole point is like you're not supposed to be influencing the other referees, right? It's supposed to be your decision. Oh, okay. So All it's right. like, I mean, I've definitely been at meets where it gets like a little loosey goosey and, and like people go like, did you see that? Did you see that? Like, or make a face or something like that. Like try, try to avoid that. Just True. You might be creating bias towards that athlete. Like, yes. like, yes. And then all of a sudden now that referee that you made that face that is like, wait a second, what am I looking for? What did they see that I didn't see? And then they start you know, all right. I, I am, I amend, things, so yeah. I amend my comment instead, write it down, <laughs> like, <laughs> or, or, or write it down. Or, uh, another good thing too, is, uh, a, a Jerry, Jerry Dunn, uh, category one IWF, uh, Tecmo official for New York. Uh, he, he told me, he said before the session, uh, go and watch the athletes in the warm up room. See, see what their lifting is. Talk to them. Like so that way it's not like uh, scary when they come out for you or them. And if you see someone doing something a little unorthodox, you'll be ready for it. Cause some athletes come out and it's just like, boom, boom, boom. And you're like, I don't know what happened on that lift. What locked out first. It was very erratic. At least now you're ready for it instead of your first time seeing it when they come out. Uh, also like uh, different techniques, like a split snatch. Okay, uh, on a split snatch, if that back knee touches the floor, that's a no lift. So if you've never seen one before in person or you're not ready for it, you'd be like, I don't know what happened. That's good, good lift. Still a thing, even to this day, when I am refereeing, you're so used to just like your standard snatch that like when somebody pulls a split snatch out, like it like startles me for a second. And I'm like, oh, oh my God. I, oh, yeah, I have to hit a button. <laughs> yeah, yeah it's they're, yeah, so they're so rare but yeah <laughs> go, go in the back and observe the warm-up you know if you have some time uh, uh talk to the athletes and get to and you'll start to see little things all right uh, and then you can also ask someone else so let's say if i'm back there and i'm like seeing something i could go to jerry and be like, jerry I, what what should i be doing on, on this and we can look at it and then maybe even you know um uh, someone might say something like to the lifter. I don't, I don't know what might happen, but at, at least you have uh, a plan going into the session versus going in cold. Yes. Good idea. And I mean, the rule used to be, we had for a little while also um, that you, oh, gosh, you had to, if you have an elbow that doesn't lock out, you were supposed to find the referees that were judging you, like find, you know, ask the marshal who the referees were and show them before mm -hmm. you went out and sat down but that's insane you can't do that especially at national meets because your referee might be still refing over at a different platform yeah. because we do everything so you know tight together so um now it's just i mean that rule is just 
point to your elbows, you know, if you have an issue with that as you're walking out to the barbell on the platform, like you don't have to worry about it ahead of time. Yeah. Now, now uh, will the app, like if you do, if you go out there and you do this to the refs and, and like, this is as far as it locks out for me. And I'm like, this is as far as it goes. Um, the referees will, will honor that or cause like, I've also heard on like, uh, if I go out there and do this, then now it's a target for that elbow. And they're just going to be watching that. I, I tend to agree agree with that statement to be honest with you because I would say that oh gosh I'm not going to put an actual number on it but a very high percentage of people that come out and and do that little demonstration like that's actually not a problem for you it's just you have a lockout problem that in your training your coach has seen has suggested that you show it to people but here here's the bottom line I my per, I personally you do not need to show me that when you come out because if I'm a good referee if you come out and your arm only locks out at this degree and like you could, if your elbow doesn't move, that's it. That's your lockout. Like that's yeah. a good lift. If the yeah, elbow like, moves, no lift. Like if I catch it like this and I stand up and there's no movement and like, you see, like, I'm all like, this is, this is where I'm at. Then that's a good lift. Yeah. But, done deal. And also I've been in a situation where, well, all right, this is the standard now for the next lift. So if I come out and boom, oh, press out, right? Yeah, so I, yeah. I have had masters athletes come out where I'll see what, where they're at and like, all right, that's, this is how they catch it. It's five feet out in front of them and their arms are bent. If now I'm looking for a deviation from that, like if I see the elbows co collapse and you press in to that limited range of motion, that's a press out. Like, so you don't get a free pass on bent elbows for any little situation because that's the limitation of your movement. You have to still go to the, end of your limitation and hold it yeah yeah totally so i mean point of your elbows don't like frankly if you point to your elbows i'm immediately like mm, all right let's see if this person actually has this problem or you know what but i mean you know yeah. to each their own <laughs> right right now people are like why does james have a pvc pipe in his <laughs> living room next to the <laughs> there's i mean there's weightlifting and CrossFit stuff everywhere in here. This is uh, just what 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 we do. All right, so those are the the referees. Uh, the marshal. What does the marshal do? So the marshal is my personal favorite job, as you know. Um, some local meets don't have it. Sometimes it's like you don't have enough staffing. The marshal will also be the speaker and the you know timekeeper, all those things. But at national meets, especially, um, the marshal is the person who is taking the changes from the athlete cards and inputting them into the computer so that the, you know, whatever the scoring system is for the meet will have those changes. And it, this way it alerts, you know, loaders, they have to put this amount on the barbell, the speaker knows, who, you know, who's coming up next. Um, but it's just, it's a fun job. Like a lot of times you will be in the back room and uh, you get to, you're in the back, you're watching all these coaches kind of like play chess. It's really fun. It's fun to watch the athletes warm up and get ready. Um, and then, yeah, I don't, I don't know. That's, that's absolutely my favorite job. And, and it gets a sessions. Oh my gosh. So much fun. And it gets really intense. <laughs> yeah. You see the, 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 the coaches battles, everyone's got their pens out. Someone's yeah. racing to the table to get their pen. Which yes. That is, I can tell you from being a speaker and, and working as a timekeeper, it meets the biggest mistake people do. And it breaks my heart every time I know it breaks yours is when people don't get in their change or declaration before the time runs out and then they're stuck at a particular weight. So for it, you have to make the change in the first 30 seconds, right? Mm -hmm. From when you're- Or a declaration, your next, yes. You know, yeah. Or a declaration for when your next clock begins. Yes. So uh, uh, let, let me try to walk us through an example, an example I've seen in person. Uh, athlete goes out and they attempt to snatch 96 kilos. They miss it. That was attempt one. A two minute clock is going to start with them and they are staying at that weight. The coach wants to bump them up. All right, we're going to go up to a hundred kilos, right? Whatever. They have to make a declaration to, to, of 96 kilos or another jump within the first 30 seconds of that two minute clock. If that time goes by, the computer system will not accept the change and the technical official will not accept the change. So they are now stuck at 96 kilos and then they have to go out and take it. I've seen coaches uh, stand behind me 
for the entirety of a two minute clock until there's 20 seconds left because they're trying to get their athlete rest. So then they go like, all right, move him up to 98 because the next guy is at 97. And I'm like, not only can I not do that, but you have to get him out there right now. And then it's chaos. And then you have to explain to the coach, you didn't get the change in or a declaration in time. You get two changes and one declaration. If you make the declaration and it's the same as the automatic increase or the weight you're currently on, you don't lose any changes. You still have two changes. Or if you're crafty, let's say you're going from 96 to 100, you could declare 97. And if you're still the athlete, you still have your two-minute clock. Then you can go 98 and then 100 or 98, 99, and you get technically three changes. You know, So how you use them is up to you. But for the love of all things, don't leave the table. Don't go run to your athlete. Just tell the table real quick, I declare this for number seven or for Sarasota or whatever it is in that situation and lock it in. Good advice. And I think actually in the TO protocols link, there is actually, if you, do you have that? Uh, TO, pro- yes, let me find it here. So TO protocols right here, right? So Right there, coach instructions for Marshall table. I'll click it. That's got some good advice. And uh, this is national meet, especially. And I mean, I know at my meets, Murder for Crows meets, we do the same thing. You you can't just walk up to me and say, athlete, you know, like Gallo is going to 50. You yeah. have to write it and you have to sign it. And you have to put the little initial underneath it. And that's the only way that it signals to the marshal to put that change into the computer. So, uh, yeah. And, and, and the time, that's how you stop the clock, too. Yeah. So that's that little document there. I just noticed that last night. And I was like, oh, wow, this is this is pretty handy. Yeah, I've never seen this before. This is actually pretty cool. Yeah. And, and another thing, too, is it does it is different at national meet versus local meet. So let's say we're at a local meet and I'm the speaker. I got the microphone here. I've got all the cards. Most speakers don't want you to write on the cards, you know, like, like, cause the cards shuffle. So you would come over and you would say, uh, Hey James, move Sarah to 96. Right. And I would, I would do that. And I would tell the timekeeper slash computer person next to me to make that change. There are different formats for different meets. That's one example Another example is we could easily just have the speaker table there and the cards are static. Like at a national meet, they don't shuffle. So your athlete's card will always be in the lower left-hand corner if that's where you see it. And they're facing you because you will write on it. Um, so, and there'll be pens and papers there. You have, to, But it's not always the case. And I know that can get confusing where at the local level, the, someone's shuffling the cards and they're writing it because the cards are facing them. Some local meets do it. The cards are facing you and there is a marshal or you just tell them and national meets. It's definitely static and you have to do the writing. Uh, I know it's confusing sometimes. That's why it's good as a coach or an athlete to approach the table and see what the system is going to be for that particular meet, especially if it's at a local meet. It's different all the time at local meets, but nationals, this is how it will be. There's going to be all that stuff going on. Yes. And cards are technically supposed to be out on a table 30 minutes before a session starts. Again, doesn't always happen at national meets based on like if a session is still running and uh, we can't put the cards out on the table because we're still using the cards from the previous session, but they're always there by the computer. You can ask the marshal that's sitting behind the table, hey, can I see the cards for the next session? If you want to check something out, go for it. They should they should be there. Yeah, they'll help you. You know, uh, a lot of coaches don't know that, that if you're like, oh, the cards aren't out yet. I want to see what the lifting order is, how much time we have to warm up. Go over there and ask Sarah or whoever may be at the table and be like, hey, do you have the cards for session B? Can I see them? And they'll give them to you, right? There's no. Yeah. Not against the law. Nope. Not against the law. (laughs) So that's the marshal. And the timekeeper is kind of the same or. Uh, Timekeeper, I would put more. It's it's usually because usually, especially at national meets, um, the speaker also is the timekeeper. And you're, you're controlling all of that um, at the system. Um, at national meets, though, like I said, for testing, you will be a timekeeper for t- at least two sessions next to the speaker. So um, that's not like a very, uh, that's not like a separate job necessarily so much. Okay. And then the speaker itself, um, let's talk about that. They they control the flow of the meet and they're, mm-hmm. they're, they're instructing the loaders. All right, like, like if, if Sarah hits 50 kilos on the snatch, 
then a successful lift, they'll say, all right, loaders, uh, take it to 51 because there's an automatic one kilo increase. And then you remain the lifter unless uh, there's someone else who happens to be taking 51 or until you change the weight uh, to something higher. And that yeah. also may affect the order. Mm -hmm. And the speaker yeah. will also announce, uh, let's say if there's three athletes. Let me see if I can get this right. Uh, I'll, I'll use I'll use uh, uh, James, Joe, and Frank. So, all right, our, our current lifter is uh, is James McDermott. Frank Ford is on deck. Joe Rodriguez to follow, right? The terminology has changed. Uh, well, technically, they don't like you using baseball terms. So on deck is maybe a little bit, but like, oh, yeah. okay. So, I mean, I, I've never heard like a standard, but yeah, they say, cause baseball is not like international enough, which is crazy. Cause I'm like, yeah. Hey, Japanese people love baseball. So isn't it in the Olympics baseball, right? <laughs> so it's, a, but, but yeah, they, they say stay away from like sports jargon like that. So, um, yeah. And, and you don't want to say like, uh, it used to be like, like, uh, uh, Joe Rodriguez is in the hole, you know, uh, I don't know why they changed that one. I don't either. Because that yeah. I've known I've known that one. Actually, I've known all three of these since powerlifting, like mm. way before I was involved in like that's how they do it there. What are the three correct terms? If you That's what I'm saying. I don't I don't really I've not heard a standard. And I mean it's gotten to the point where a lot of people don't even uh like they'll say, you know, so and so is up next. Mm -hmm. Uh and then they stop at that point and they don't even say like or get ready is usually like, you know, the third one. I I think if I'm thinking about like who I can hear speaking, but yeah. Okay. And there's a whole protocol for being the speaker. I'm sure it's up here. Yes. Yes. Yep. There, there it is. Speaker and timekeeper protocol. You can click that document and it looks crazy right now. There's a lot going on the screen, but if you read through it, it'll give you best practices. There are a number of things that you need to be saying with every lift. Uh, you need to announce the person's club. You need to do the introduction uh, when you walk all the athletes around the platform. So you, I, I would say that maybe for this position, you should be used to speaking for a long period of time, everyone hearing your voice, being not the center of attention, but pretty adjacent to it on um, you are, you are the person that if this slows down, if it's going wrong, you might affect that. And you have to be comfortable going into the back and calling all the athletes over you should have some public speaking skills is maybe what I'm saying. Yes. And you don't, this is like a problem too, at the national level. It's like, you don't need, there shouldn't be any commentary. Like there are commentators that we pay now to like do the live stream. They're the ones doing the commentary. Your job is purely to like help the meet run efficiently and get the right athlete up on the platform uh, yeah. with the proper weight and have, you know, the flow going. So yeah. No, no one expects you to put on a show. No, no. And I mean, don't don't make comments about, you know, uh, certainly don't call a lift as you see it, even though you are a referee, like you wait until you see the judge's decision. Uh, yeah, just keep just just the facts, ma'am. Yep. Yep. <laughs> keep when in doubt, keep it simple, because uh, uh, that's when the 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 wheels start to come off a little bit. Um, I do like to say, uh, I, I I like when like, you know, as a PR and you can announce in the mic, that was a PR or whatnot. Like that's, I think that I think that's maybe as far as you should take it. If it's something. Yeah. I mean, certainly at a local meet, like for sure do that. Uh, if somebody is like, you know, qual has qualified for a meet with that lift, like, oh, it's super nice. But yeah, we yeah. don't just don't do that at a national or higher meet. <laughs> yeah. uh, all right. So there's the speakers. And we don't need to go through all of them, but you can see all of them right here. Um, so yeah, ch check out this page. It'll be here It'll uh, in the show notes. Uh, so we got speaker, weigh-in official. We kind of touched upon that earlier. Anything to add on weigh-in official? Uh, weigh-ins are super easy. That's a good way to get some sessions in. And also, especially if you are willing to do a 6 a.m. weigh-in at a national meet, like people will love you forever. <laughs> yeah. You are but, the, you are the favorite if you're yes, doing that. Yes. Um, but that's, that's an easy job because it's one hour. Uh, that's it. Not two plus what, like if you're refereeing a session and now it's very easy because everybody has to weigh in in singlets. Um, but yeah, I mean, generally like the way I, I mean, I love doing weigh-ins because I love to get to know all of these athletes that I'm, especially if I'm going to be refereeing that session, I like to, you know, be like, Hey, friendly face. I'm going to be out there refereeing for you. It's just, it's fun, but I don't know, what? but and it's, and I have like a thing where I try to have like a record 
where I try to see how many athletes I can get in in a short amount of time. So I will usually give a speech outside like a couple minutes before the weigh-in time starts, let everybody know what to expect when they come in there, tell them to be ready. Sometimes if I'm, if I'm there long enough and people are kind of milling around outside, I'll check IDs so that I know already. I can just be like, come in, give me your openers and, and sign stuff. And we're going to get you out of here so you can go eat your food real quick. <laughs> yeah. And, and athletes appreciate that. And, and at national meets, I know the practice is to try to get the people doing the weigh-in to be sitting in the chair if possible. So that way there's some continuity, um, from once, once thing to the next, you know, so that's your first chance to like meet the athletes, shake their hand, introduce yourself. If that's going to be the way, like it, it's, it's never perfect. Like, especially at a local meet, more than likely the people doing the weigh-ins are not going to be in the referee chair. Cause it's, it's hard to find volunteers to do all that stuff. Oh yeah. And I mean, at a national meet, like you, you don't get that either because like basically the way it ends up working, like, let's just say, for example, I'm going to, my first gig for the day is usually a weigh in. And then I'm sitting in a referee chair or a marshal chair for the rest of the day, because it's too hard to like with the way that weigh-ins are staggered. And then if you're trying to work like back to back sessions, it's too hard to like plan to be able to fit a weigh-in session in. So it's like te ten technically it's like a lot of the times competition secretaries, uh, are the ones that get stuck just doing wanes all day. And yeah, you get some help along the way, but it's it's not like a thing that you can necessarily bounce between so easily and balance with the other tasks that you might want to do. Well, that, that's a great segue into what is the competition secretary? Sure. Um, so competition secretaries, we do it a little differently um, in the United States with USA Weightlifting than they do uh, internationally. Um, internationally, like the competition secretary does sit there and you will do like all the weigh-ins and you are in charge of keeping all of that data. Um, but for us at USA Weightlifting, the competition, competition secretary usually have two, minimum of two. Um, they are assigned by the technical committee. Um, like for example, I'm going to be a competition secretary for North American Open Finals uh, later this year in December out in Tucson. So I have to be there the whole meet, every session. Um, and you, your primary job is staffing. You are going to be making sure that every critical position is filled and appropriately. Um, you know, making sure that we have all category ones sitting on juries for A sessions. Like that's a requirement we're supposed to be um, abiding by. Uh, yeah. But so you've got it. everybody's staffing. number. You're calling people, <laughs> texting people. Yes. What, what, what happens if you can't fill a position, then the comp secretary has to sit in essentially, that, right? That's correct. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, in, in a worst case scenario, you will pull USA weightlifting staff into a seat. Like, I mean, I'm sure you've seen JP sitting on jury. It's hilarious oh, yeah. when, when we need him and we're like, Hey, somebody get JP a jacket, you know? <laughs> yeah. And, so. and, if you've been to a national event, more than likely the people you see at the marshal's table are USAW staff members uh, who are filling in for that role, correct? Um, I mean, I think that that's like a, we try not to do that. That's, it's preferred to not, like we would like them to be doing other jobs elsewhere. Like, cause it's, it's crazy to like depend on them, but for sure at meets where we are having a trouble, having trouble staffing, we will, you know, ask Alex Love to go sit at a marshal table for us for a session and i mean i don't i don't know that they love it i can't speak for yeah. them i don't i don't think they do i think they'd rather be working at registration where they're also able to do their other usa weightlifting work but um but yeah so that's the competition secretary primary job staffing cool and the technical controller we briefly touched on that position way back Yes. Um, so like I said, national meets, we tend not to have this position full a lot of the time. We always do for A sessions, very important. Uh, you're basically just uh, the police kind of like you're in the uh, in na national, I'm sorry, at international meets, you'll have two technical controllers and one person is kind of out in the front of the field of play, like out watching the actual lifting happening. And then the other one will be kind of in the back watching the warm up area and the marshals table. And uh, your job is also to communicate with the jury during A sessions because so, so you're, you're going to make sure that the barbell weight is correct, that the field of play is everything's clean, like the platform's clean, doesn't need a dusting. Uh, you're going to make sure that lifters have the proper size equipment, like their belt is within the parameters. Uh, they don't have tape. 
extending past their fingers on their hands. No tape on uh, the elbows. That's right. Within five centimeters of, you know, up, upper and lower <laughs> elbow. <laughs> um, but yeah, and, and the clothing stuff, like all the leggings and, and, um, all of those rules. But um, so it's, it's a little bit different when we have just one person doing it at a, an A session at a national meet. You'll, you'll never see this at a local meet ever. Um, it's a pretty tough job because, uh, and then that's the other thing too. If as soon as a lift happens, if you're out there watching the lift, you are supposed to look over at the jury and look at the, pre the jury president and see if they need any communication because they're the ones that will tell you if maybe there's a potential overturn or you have to run like now we have um, challenge cards at ACE sessions and national meets or national championships, I should say only, but um, which also is in the protocols. I think there's like a little part for the how, how to use the challenge cards. You'll run the challenge card over from the coach or the athlete over to the jury table and then they will do all the review stuff. Um, it's a very yeah. active job. There's it, you can't can snooze be. on this one. No, no. You, you're standing the entire time for sure. And you're going back and forth, checking on stuff. But if you want and to get uh, your steps yeah. in and burn some calories, <laughs> you know, it's true. Yeah. Yeah. It's not the most exciting job, but you know, it, it it's, it's got its moments. <laughs> uh, a, a meat director doesn't count under the technical official umbrella, do they? No. So that, that's a conversation for another <laughs> time, but they have to, they have to find all of the, um, yes. the people at most local meets. Are we yeah. missing any positions? Did we talk about all of them? I think that's all of them. Yeah. So let's let's touch upon um, at a national. How are you doing on time? Uh, uh, a little bit more time. <laughs> a little, little bit. All right. Yeah. We're yeah. We're, we're right down to the bottom of the list here. Uh, talk really quickly on uniform standards. Okay. So local meets. It's at the discretion of the meet director. They can tell you what they want to do. Um, you know. Like I'm running a meet next weekend. Jerry actually is coming to help. And he asked me, you know, do you want me to wear my blue suit? And uh, local meets, we we don't tend to do that. It would be nice, but it's like, that's just one more obstacle to get to getting referees that will sit in the chair, especially when they already have to do the exams and the safe sports certification that can take two to three hours. <laughs> oh yeah, I know that <laughs> thing. It's a financial commitment. So we are understanding about that. But again, up to the meet directors, uh, national meets, uh, it's a little bit more strict. And if you're a local referee coming to work at a national meet, they just ask that you don't wear any gym clothes, no jeans, um, like maybe a button down shirt and some nice uh, like dress pants, uh, bonus points. If you wear a tie or a scarf, um, that would be appreciated. And then if you're a national level referee or higher, you have to wear the blue suit. And and that's like a whole uniform that is within the IWF uh, TCRR. Um, and I yeah. think that would help with confidence a little bit too. Like if you're dressed to impress and looking good, you're going to, you're going to feel good about your job. You know, if you're having your, your doubts, eh, maybe, maybe that's your, <laughs> I, 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 would, I, would I would rather so. be comfortable for the entire day when I'm working like 16 hours in a day than I would, you know, uncomfortable yeah. wearing Being a shirt strangled in. by oh. a tie all day yeah. uh, is also, uh, yeah. All right. I get that too. There's not, both sides. Not my favorite, but I understand. And it makes us like easy to spot when you have a question or you need something. So I'm not going to complain about that, but yeah. Well, we, we've talked a lot about the differences between working a national meet and working a, a local meet. Um, some or a, a lot of the national meets, actually, I think all of them have a verification of final entries meeting and a technical meeting. Mm -hmm. And we do that for the state championships. And I do it for my regional. And I think Joe Rod does it for his as well. Uh, can you talk about that meeting and why it's important for both officials and athletes? For and the, te the technical uh, officials meeting? Uh, the ver uh, uh, both of them, verification and technical. Uh, I mean, verification of final entries is less important for technical officials. I would say like that's more for coaches and athletes and the meet director to be able to make sure that uh, every, everybody is in the proper weight class. There aren't going to be any surprises, especially at national meets when you're not a lot, when you have to make weight. Um, it's, it's, it's more that and just getting all of those ducks in a row so that the meet director can make the schedule appropriately and not have like a weird imbalance of lifters and sessions. And taking um, any last minute changes yes. or weight classes, stuff like that. Yeah, exactly. Before so, they're locked in. Cause they, they do get locked in. Yes. Yes. After that, that's it. You're, you're done. Locked in. Can't make any changes after that. See on meet day. Hope you make. 
<laughs> hope, hope your openers are within 20 kilograms, you know. <laughs> Check your emails. Check yes, your emails. Yes, I'm dealing with that right now. I sent out the final schedule and final start list for my meet and I'm still getting changes. I'm like, hey guys, where, where were you, you know, two months ago when I sent this? <laughs> Uh, read please but um but yeah and then the technical officials meeting uh like you said not as common with local meets but national meets i highly recommend uh especially if you're like kind of new to this and you're a local referee going it's always uh so a couple a month or two before a national event you're going to get an email from usa weightlifting it usually is signed by pager at the bottom and it says that there's a call for technical officials and it's got all of the information like i said the payment structure that we broke down um and it's got a link to a google spreadsheet and that spreadsheet is like king for the meet if you're a technical official so that will have all of the schedule where you can pop your name in uh so you can pick a session you want to work um it also at the top of the Google spreadsheet, it has a link to the, it will say when the technical officials meeting is, it's usually like the Sunday before a meet. And um, once you go, it, I, I just can't recommend it enough. You're going to get lots of useful information, even, even people that like, you know, do this all the time. I still recommend it because you're going to get information about things that uh, you might not have gotten about like the venue so you'll see like maybe where the entrance is that you should be using, like any tips about like uh, transportation. Um, where the food's going to be. That Yes, that's usually one of the most important things where where technical official food will be or like a lounge. If you're going to get vouchers, um, they'll introduce you and let you know who the competition secretaries are for a meet so that you know. Um, a big thing also is that when you work at a national meet, you should sign up for a uh, the TO WhatsApp chat. And I mean, that link is always available. It's it's usually in like the doc, the, there's like a source of truth link that's at the top of every meets spreadsheet schedule. And it says like source of truth. And that will have actually all of these files, these protocols are all in there. Oh, uh, perfect. It, yes, it's got like everything you could possibly need. Sometimes it'll have a map of the venue showing you where stuff is. Sometimes it'll have like the schedule for like shuttle buses, um, tells you where food is. It will have usually this uh, national ref checklist that you have pulled up the link in there just to be able to go over. It's like, I mean, that's super, super important. And it's a very good thing to have. So that's why it's always at the top of the spreadsheet. Yeah. But yeah, this checklist is pretty cool. Like on like, so here, here's like, for example, the things that you should have on you, you know, small notebook, uh, a couple pens, uh, like two two red pens and two to three black pens because you need those different pens depending on the job that you're doing and if you're marking on the the athlete card and you're a marshal it should be red pen anything you're writing in right red pen for a marshal that's it yeah everything else blue black i like these guys yeah <laughs> uh, yeah it's the it's the all the pens in one so I, I i always bring this to meets with me and that's what i'm writing with so that's a good one so yeah, this this checklist is is great, and uh, it, it this is like it has some information on the testing, but also uh, just like what what you should be doing in, in all these things and your your mindset. Yep, just like I mean that's that's a checklist that's been compiled by a few of our highest TOs and uh, just from all of their experience over the years. So it's like it's it's I mean you can probably get a lot from that before you even have to like ask somebody a question. So I definitely recommend checking that out. Perfect. I think, uh, I think we might have covered everything. Do you have anything, <laughs> do you have anything else to add on all things technical official? No, I mean, I, I, I appreciate everybody that volunteers at meets like everybody in New York city knows this about me i will ask everybody for help all the time i mean even if you can just work one session if you want to just load anything like i mean we will find a space for you and it is so appreciated because it's uh going to you know take it's going to alleviate some stress off of like you know everybody kind of always has at their local meets like their core group of people that they rely on and it's like if you can let somebody be able to go to the bathroom <laughs> because <laughs> they're getting a break like it's it's really appreciated a lot so, can we put that mean... out there that at the end <laughs> of a session the referees should have front of the line privileges to the Agreed. bathroom yeah. because many times at a local meet the schedules are tight 
sessions might be running over, things like that. We don't want that to happen, but it does happen, especially if it's a new meet director who doesn't didn't put the schedule together well. They only have the 10 minute break to get to the bathroom. And if they're at the back of the line and everybody's got to go in and out, they got to be back in that chair for the next session. You know, it's, it's, sure. it's tough. It's yeah. Tough. Yeah. That's why I like that you're you're the you're the murder crows open where you uh you guys were announcing on the microphone. Uh please everybody after this lift let the officials get to the bathroom first. Yeah. I mean, that's yeah, it's it's critical. You got to let those people have their breaks. Maybe they need to go eat some food they haven't eaten because they've been working three sessions in a row whatever. But um yeah. And I mean That's the I, fastest 10 minutes of your day uh, when you're trying to do all that. Yeah. And I mean, sometimes, I mean, we do it sometimes too, where if a session is really running behind and you have a lot of athletes in a session, uh, I mean, at national meets, technically, I think it's, if you, if you have 12 athletes or higher, you're supposed to only get a five minute break in between snatch and clean and jerk. And we try to do the same thing, especially if we're running late on time. And that really makes it hard for people to go to the bathroom. So we are especially aware. Of that. Yeah. And cause those referees, like, if you're if you're a spectator in the crowd, you can go anytime. But those referees, they're literally going to be stuck in the chair for 90 minutes, two hours, <laughs> three hours to get a snatch session done on a really large, you know, athlete it's pool. It's true. Uh, so you, they got to have some some relief. Help them yeah. out. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah, I mean, I just think being a technical official makes you a better athlete and a coach. Like once you know those rules and you are very proficient in them, like, you know. It's like, like I joke about my jerk needing work and it's like, I am never going to get angry at anybody or for criticizing my, cause I'm like, I know what I need to fix because I need to be, you know, doing yeah. it within, within the rules. So there's no surprises at that point. If you're informed on all of this information, right. you know, if, if you're deeply involved in the sport, be a weightlifting nerd and nerd out on all of it. Yeah. Yeah. And it's really nice. Like at the end of a meet that ran really well, I mean, this definitely falls under the meet director category, especially, but even just as a TO, if you worked at a meet the whole day and people are like smiling and enjoying themselves and they're like, Oh, this was like the best meet ever. Like, like that just feels really good. So it's like, if you can be a part of that, like, why wouldn't you want to do that? <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, well, great, Sarah, this was awesome. I'm glad we covered all this. I really hope it helps people. Uh, we'll, we'll put it out there. There'll be a lot of links in the show notes to all the different websites and resources. And also on our website, I think I'm going to put some of these links as well, uh, especially to the exam itself, that little PDF thing there. Uh, do you have any parting words of advice for someone who's looking to level up and really pursue being a technical official? Mm. Just you always feel comfortable asking people questions. Like, I mean, that's, that's the only way you're ever going to learn and feel comfortable in these things. So yeah, I, I, everybody in this sport, I mean, I love the TEO community, like nationally, like every, everybody's great. Like most people are super supportive and will help you out. And I mean, you know, they'll give you the shirt off their back, like stuff like that. <laughs> yeah. Be, so be a part of it. Be a part of it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I, I, I like that. You know, it's a, a, I, that's one of the biggest pieces of advice for, for anything. Ask for help. Like, uh, I, I almost think it would be maybe an error if you're a new referee and you left a meet that you're working at and you didn't ask any questions. Yeah. You know? Yeah. So I, I, I don't I, know anybody that's done that. That would be crazy. I would like to know if somebody. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I, I, I love that. Um, I would say my, my piece of advice is just to practice um, something similar to what I said before on watching other officials is there's so many full sessions of lifting out there. You can go on to USA Weightlifting's website and watch the AO finals sessions. And you could sit there for a, a, a little notebook and practice your, your, your refing. You know, if you're watching a live stream, if you're watching the world championships or if you're watching the AO finals or nationals, ref it and see if your decision matches up with, with the other referees. And maybe even just for fun, say, all right, I'm the center referee for this session or I'm the left or right, you know, but yeah, the more you yeah. practice, it doesn't have to be, I can only practice three times a year when I make it to a local meet. You can practice pretty regularly with all the live stream videos out there. Yeah, indeed. And then you can write down questions and send it to Sarah. Be like, hey, I was, here's, <laughs> I was watching the world championships. 
they no lift this athlete at the highest level. I can't see what they see. What what is going on here? Because it's really hard to ref those high highest levels. Like their flaws don't poke out as much as some of the you know at the local level. So definitely watch those world championships. And if you're not sure, or if it's a controversial decision that makes social media, number one, all right, another piece of advice: don't post stuff on social media about the decisions and stuff. Come on yeah, now, please, please. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but take the questions to someone like Sarah, who is at the highest level, who can give you more insight onto why that decision was made. Yeah, for sure. Awesome. Well, Sarah, thank you so much uh, for your time. Uh, this was this was a lot of fun. Thank you. Where, it was good time. <laughs> where can people f follow Sarah? So, uh, Sarah Soto Rep uh, is my account personally. And then I'm also, uh, helping out with NYC underscore weightlifting on Instagram. And that's pretty much all the social media I can handle. So yeah, yeah there's a lot. <laughs> uh, you can follow me, James A. McDermott on Instagram, Adirondack weightlifting for that region that, that I'm in charge of, uh, New York weightlifting for our organization's Instagram page. And of course, follow USA weightlifting's Instagram page too. USA underscore weightlifting is yeah. what it is. All right. Well, everybody, thank you so much for listening. Sarah, thank you again for coming on. Thank you.